Maybe we don't know. Maybe we don't know. This time, 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 this
a lot of the dudes at the gym were like, oh, you shouldn't train. That's not cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, that's even more strange. Like, because <clears throat> I, I guess it made some sense in my time because Sharma and Dave Graham both didn't train, at least like it didn't appear that they did. Um, and so people were like, oh, if they're good, you know, you can get good too, which completely goes against the whole survivorship bias kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was the first advice I got. Man, it's, uh, that's something I'm still very much like against. Like it doesn't take much training and even to call it training, like push-ups, pull-ups, just some simple stuff. Like, man, I wish I would have found kettlebells like earlier on Yeah. just to become a little more robust, um, kind of make myself a little more uh, resilient against injuries down the road. That would have been huge. Yeah, and a lot of training, especially what we do, just looks like really intentional climbing, you know. And one of one of my most popular articles that I've written for the site, which I wrote a long time ago, was Chris Sharma doesn't train, or does he? Yeah. And essentially breaking down Chris's like seasonal process and saying, oh, here's why it looks exactly like the way that we would train. Yeah. You know he goes in with a really specific intention. Not to mention, there's a reason that you can really only name a couple of those people and the same names always come up. Yeah. You know, well, Chris Sharma and Dave Graham don't train. Okay, who else? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a reason there's two, you know, because they're exceptional. They are the exception. Uh, most people do in some way, shape, or form view what they're doing as training. Yeah whether they would use that word or not. Yeah. You know, and it's, there are a lot of, if we're even just looking at high-end climbers, there are a lot of high-end climbers who do train, but until recently, the last few years, like if you've only been climbing, let's say three years, you would say, man, training's huge. It's popular. Like you look on Instagram, everyone's doing one-arm pull-ups on the beast makers, right? things like that, hanging tiny little ledges, moonboarding, all this. But even five five years ago, man, it was not cool for a pro to like talk about training. Yeah. Um, and some of them still carry that same almost like stigma around mm-hmm. to where they totally don't post do. about training, but they definitely do. Yeah. They totally do things outside of their climbing to improve their climbing. Just don't want to talk about it. Yeah. And, you know, back in the day, even on the biggest videos of the day, there was... Fred Nicole doing pinky one arms on a hang from hanging from a sling. You mm-hmm. know, there was John Backer on his backer ladder. I mean, training tools had names. You know, they invented training tools specifically for climbing. Yeah, you know, Todd Skinner doing a lot of those like one finger work mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and Todd had his. I can't remember what he called. It, it wasn't the pain box. It was something else. Bill Ramsey has the pain box. Todd had. Todd had a box that he had put all these miserable little crimps on Mm -hmm. and you would essentially just move around underneath of this suspended box, Mm -hmm. you know, grabbing miserable little holds and compressing between them or, you know, using compressing between your foot and your hands and early, early training tools. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's my first one is, don't train, uh, just climb. And, you know, what do you think is the intention for people behind this? Like, cause there, I I think people still give this advice with good intention. Yeah. Um, so what do you think that stems from? I mean, I do think climb more is good advice. Mm -hmm. I think just climb more is bad advice. Yes. And I think what people mean is climb more. And, and that, and that says that you can go in with an intention. You can go in with something specific that you're going to work on and want to do. Whereas just climb more means, or has this connotation of, oh, just go in the gym, climb, whatever, do whatever. You're, you're going to automatically get better like magic. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, just to go off on a slight tangent here, we have our, New proven plans, the two Just Climb More series, which are kind of a tongue-in-cheek 
jab at all those people saying, oh, just climb more, just climb more. You don't need to train. Mm -hmm. And these are proven plans specifically for beginners or relatively new climbers who want to learn how to improve faster. And a lot of it is just really intentional, specific climbing. And I think that's what people mean, and I think it's good advice. But I think it goes bad when they discount it as if it's not a real thing. You're not actually training. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, there's so much behind climbing more. Um, and it's having that intention is important. Like, you know, I was talking with someone. He played golf at a semi-professional level, mm -hmm. got into climbing, and to him just climbing what he would maybe refer to as like oh i just climb a bunch right he has so much intention he has yep. all these different things he draws from from another sport where he knows what pra good practice looks like so to him he might say oh yeah these are i'm just climbing with general fundamentals but his general fundamentals are so much higher than someone who doesn't have that level of expertise in another sport so if he were to say to someone else like oh yeah just like I just climbed, go climb, like just climb. They won't have everything else built in. Right, exactly. And you, you know, yes, Chris Sharma and Dave Graham didn't do a lot of what we'd conventionally call training, but they also never went into a climbing session just like scattered and willy nilly. You know, both of those guys are ridiculously focused mm -hmm. and try very hard and work through problems in a really specific way, you know? So that's what the just climb more proven plans tries to teach as well as let's build up a, a base for training later. Yeah. So, and I think that's the smart way to go about it. Yeah, I think so too. All right. My first one, I'm going to, I'm going to go with an easy one here. Um, Wear the tightest shoes you can get on your feet. Oh, I've got that one on here too. That, and that may have been a little more true in the mid nineties mm -hmm. when shoe technology was not what it is today. Yeah. But even then my first real pair of climbing shoes were Boreal lasers. Sick. I currently wear a size nine. Uh -huh. They were five and a half. Oh God. And I could get them on my feet. It was a struggle, mm -hmm. but I could get them on. And that was the advice I got. If you can get the shoes on your feet, then they fit you. Yep. And and it was miserable. Climbing indoors, like on short boulders, was okay. Going outside to the red and trying to climb a 90-foot pitch oh, in God. shoes that, that a ballerina wouldn't have put on was fucking miserable. And I hated it. So... If the advice you're giving is just going to make someone dislike rock climbing, it's probably really bad advice. Yeah. I Man, I completely agree with this one. Like, I was told the same thing. And shoe technology has come a long way. Like, their shoes are now, certain companies especially, have been designing shoes that you can wear them a little bit bigger, more comfortable, and they're still going to perform very well, which is awesome. Because, um, man, tight shoes suck. Like if you Like, if you can't jog around in your shoes they're probably too tight. Like if you're wearing shoes that Ooh, are- A lot of people are going to push back against that statement. Yeah. And I mean, that's <laughs> that's fine. Like they probably climb clunky. Like yeah. they may, like they walk around like they've got cloven hooves on. Like if you can't be comfortable, you're not going to climb comfortably. Like, yeah, I mean, it's kind of that simple. And you look at people now, like it, I definitely came up in an era of wear tight shoes and I've been slowly going up in size. And it's hard for me because my feet are strong in a really bunched up position. Mm -hmm. But the second they get more flat, they're not that strong. Right. Uh, but I see people now who they never downsized. So they're climbing hard, but in big flat shoes and their feet are strong in that flatter position. And I'm like, man, that's nice. You wear comfier shoes than me. And you're like just as competent on small feet as I am. Yep. It sucks to be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I can, I'm all for technology that improves whatever skill it is you do you know and shoes that work better improve your climbing but if we watch somebody who's really 
who's a master with their feet. Angie Payne comes to mind. The, yeah. the way she grabs footholds with her feet. That has nothing to do with how tight her shoes are. Mm-hmm. Zero. She's just mastered using her feet. So I think the tight shoes, like get put on the tightest shoes you can possibly put on was this weird crutch that almost allowed people to not work on their footwork because they've got really tight shoes Man, and they must yeah. work. Yeah. And for small footholds, like that kind of was an easy crutch initially. Like just, you know, if your feet are so crammed up that they can't move, like it's just like having little hooks for feet that you can put on holds. Yeah. Um, and another thing too, is if you're like, if you're a beginner, um, something I would really recommend if a lot of gems now offer, if you have a membership, it comes with free rentals, man, when you first start, wear rental shoes kind of as long as you can. Mm. Like if you can get away with it for, you know, a couple months, like the difference between if you want to buy your own shoes at two weeks into climbing versus two months into climbing, like your, your comfort that your feet can handle is going to be completely different. Kind of how you feel about everything is going to be different. And you're going to find something that's going to fit you and work a little bit better. Um, so that's what I'd recommend. And yeah, start comfortable. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, you, you look back in history, there were a lot of guys, a lot of women, a lot of people that climbed very hard in like Boreal aces, which were essentially like strapping two by fours to your feet because, yeah. because that's what people thought trad climbers needed back then. And, and they still climbed really, really hard. Mm-hmm. So it's far less about the shoes far more about how you use them and just a another kind of side tangent about shoes something i'm learning about shoes now and about wearing shoes that are a little bigger instead of tight is if i'm wearing a tighter pair of shoes even if it's like the size that i like which is pretty comfortable Mm -hmm. if it bunches up the knuckle of my toe all of a sudden that almost deletes one of my superpowers, which is toe hooking because the knuckle of the toe pointed up takes the toe hook first and doesn't allow me to get the, you know, the whole top of my foot on the toe hook. So tight shoes can be a hindrance in some cases. Totally. Yeah. And you know, when people are designing shoes, they're designing them to fit a certain way and to be sized a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I'll see people try shoes on and I'm kind of like a shoe, like a shoe nerd for sure. Like you're more than kind of a shoe nerd. Yeah. Yeah. I love climbing shoes. Uh, I got to talk with Nathan Howitt, uh, one of the head designers of Scarpa. And like, we just geeked out for hours about how everything's made. Um, And that was a big thing he talked about. He's like, man, shoot, like we make these shoes to be fitted a certain way. And you can see people when they try and size them too tight, they're like, oh, the heel doesn't fit. And like, you know, maybe the toe doesn't feel good or like there's gap under my arch, stuff like that. And you look and it's like, if you want to full size up, that heel would work better. You're going to toe hook better. Like that shoe's just going to fit your foot better. Yep. You were just trying to force something because that's what you think is supposed to work. Um, so yeah, try different, try different sizes, go up, go down, see what fits well and try as many models as you can. Um, and a little side note, if you're trying on models in a brick and mortar store, buy from that store. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're offering like the fact that they are stocking everything and you're getting to try them on. Like, I know you could maybe save like five, 10 bucks or whatever on the internet, buy from the store, you know, support local. Yep. Totally. All for that. What's your number two? All right. Um, so this one, this one has detail and depth in it as all things, uh, trying to send the hardest grade possible. Mm. Like, and it, this was more of a kind of just what the culture was around. Like, okay, you've done V5, go try and do V6. Now you've done a V6, go try and do a V7. Yeah. And this was also in this weird era of people are like, D- but don't be a number chaser. Right. Don't trace grades. <laughs> right. Right. And it's, it's but to f- progress, go to the next number. Exactly. Yeah. And I came from a track and field background 
we were literally number chasers. For sure. Like, literally. If, if you were to go tell some, like, Usain Bolt, hey, man, it seems like you're really chasing some numbers. Like, you yeah. need to go back and find the the heart of the sport. Right. You, you just look like look at you like you're an idiot. It's like, no, like, this is the heart of the sport. Mm -hmm. Like, chasing numbers. Um, and so I'm not saying that progression is bad or progression based on numbers is bad. But progression comes from do like becoming better and becoming better. Like I wish someone would have said, Hey, like you're climbing V3, go climb all, all the V3s now. Yeah. Oh, you just climbed V4, go climb all of the V4s now. Yeah. Cause man, that like, if you want to chase numbers, that's a damn good way to do it. Like, and that's what I wish I would have done is kept building more of a base. And it took me years to realize this. I just built this little tower of very specific styles because you know, and especially when you start chasing them, you can kind of escalate through the grades if you pick a narrow niche. Oh yeah, totally. But then you leave so much behind. Like I, you know, jumped like four steps forward and then I had to take what felt like 10 steps back just to rebuild my base years later. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of value in progressing wide or deep instead of just high, mm -hmm. you know, and I write about this in one of the essays in the hard truth because that was the advice I used to give, you know, if, if somebody came up to me and I had seen them number chasing in the gym, my advice was always stop trying the hard things. You know, how do I climb harder? Stop trying the hard things. And, and people would just look at me like I was an idiot. And I had a policy of if they don't take advice the first time, don't give them advice the second time. Mm -hmm. And the few people that did rocketed through the grades eventually you know but they would they would come in and like you said they would climb every v3 you know and then they would climb every v4 mm -hmm. and eventually it's slower to get to v5 or v6 that way but by the time they got there they could do half the v5s whereas the the friends that they were initially climbing with were working on the one v5 that they might be able to do yeah. you know so I think it's a really valuable way to progress. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's uh, one thing you have to watch out for now is route setting turnover is much mm -hmm. higher than when I started. Like back then it was, mm -hmm. you know, the whole gym got reset probably like once every four months. Yep. Which in hindsight now I'm like, oh, that was sick. I know. Um, where now big gyms is like once every four weeks practically. So you can get stuck in a pattern of, oh, I'm going to try and climb all the V4s but because everything's turning over so fast, maybe you need to be on something that's a little bit harder. Like, oh, I'm going to try and do all the V5s and I just have to know that I won't be able to get them all done because they're going to turn over too fast. Yep. And that's a hard balance to strike because, man, shiny new boulders, they're fun. Um, so I think that can be a little harder now uh, than it used to be. For just, sure. Just because it's so easy to lose the quality and go, purely quantity um, but i think there's still there's still a lot of truth in that yeah and we put a lot of value in topping out boulders yeah and projecting isn't doesn't often end in topping out boulders you know so it's easy to never project and you know i'm gonna keep this is a business so i'm gonna keep hammering away at the idea that if you're a beginner you should buy our just climb more proven plans because <laughs> they do you know, give you days of both. So one day we're going to go in and focus on climbing a lot of a, a grade, a specific grade that's moderately difficult for you. And then other days we're going to come in and specifically work on things that are really hard for you, you know, that you may not send. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really valuable to have both methods in there. And oftentimes beginners, because of bad advice they've gotten, focus on one or the other at the expense of the other absolutely yeah uh, i agree like it's i think both are important and uh leaning only towards one is definitely uh you know gonna put you on the road to a cul-de-sac yep yep all right my number two is one we've we've talked about before and this is the myriad of movement myths okay. things like yep yep Keep your arms straight, get your hips in, you know, those were just thrown around 
at the gym when I was young. And, and to be fair, it was the like really prevalent style of the day. The, Mm -hmm. the French climbers were crushing everyone else and they were very twisty, you know, didn't cut feet, always three points of contact, you know, and that's what everyone thought was the way forward. So that's what they tried to tell everybody to do. And, and it, it's good advice, but it's only a small sliver of how you can climb. Mm-hmm. You know, there are so many other things to consider when you're moving. Um, and it's not always going to be best to keep your arms straight. In fact, it's pretty damn hard to climb upward keeping your arms straight all the time. Yeah. And twisting your hips in, you know, a lot of times being square is the better way and being further from the wall can be better in a lot of moves instead of trying to glue your hips to the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, there were just all these movement absolutes that don't really work. Yeah. Now I, I have one of these, uh, it's kind of one of my extras that for me, that was huge. People told me initially Static is better, controlled is better. Mm-hmm. And if I wanted to be strong, I needed to climb square. Mm. They were like twisting. You were in that era. Yeah. Like, That's interesting. I, I used to twist a lot and people were like, no, 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 no. If you want to get strong, you have to climb square. Yeah. Because twisting makes you weak. Yep. That was in the era where like boards had started to come into fashion mm-hmm. and there were rules on boards. Like you don't twist, you don't heel hook, you know? Yeah. You always climb square. Yeah, I remember there were old like pro tip videos with Malcolm Smith <laughs> yeah. and Ben Moon. Ben was like, lock off everything. Here's how you do hover drills. And Malcolm was like, yeah, twisting's, twisting makes things easy. So you're going to want to climb square. And I was like, yeah. Granted, both these guys grew up on like hard technical limestone. Like they knew how to twist. They yeah. knew how to use momentum. Yeah, like these exactly. were great rock climbers. So for them, yeah, let's make up a few little rules. There'd be like me saying, I'm pretty good when I use my thumbs. So maybe once a week I'm going to climb without <laughs> thumbs because that's going to force me into some new unique positions. Right. Everyone else, don't stop using thumbs. Right. Um, and man, I got really good at climbing square and locking off. Yep. Like, and that's still, like I haven't done that in at this point well over a decade. Still an absolute strength and twisting is still harder for me. Um, and using, I had to teach myself how to use momentum way down the road because I was like, oh, I just got to get stronger at locking off, which is awful, awful advice. Yep. Um, and side note, you know, I used to be a super twisty climber. It's how I came up. It's what they told me to do. It's what I did. And when I started like really digging into training, I went the opposite route because I recognized, oh, I always twist. That's my default. I want to learn to climb square. Mm -hmm. And I started climbing more and more square. I took that and ran with it probably for far too long. And now I've lost a lot of the mobility when twisting. And I've lost the ability to see the twisty moves as readily as I used to. Totally. Um, so it's something I have to go back to, you know, and relearn. Oh, here are situations where being twisty might be better than staying square. So, I mean, I hate cliches, but use it or lose it is real. You know, I stopped using being twisty, forgot how to do it, essentially. Yeah. I mean, it's so true in climbing where you have all these unique skills that. You know, I mean, it happens to me all the time. I'll, I'll be climbing and then I'll start looking around. I'm like, oh, like, I guess I could use a high foot here. And then they're like, oh, I can use a high foot there. And suddenly I'm relearning like this whole process I did five years ago where it's like, I was like, oh, I don't use high feet enough. Right. But you know, if you stop using them, like, yeah, you stop seeing them. Mm-hmm. So if people are out here trying to give blanket advice, straighten your arms, twist, things like that, um, always be breathing like all these things, we both agree that's bad advice, like giving these absolutes. What would the better advice be? For me, it's going to be there's no right way. So experiment, find what works for you. And once you find what works for you, try it some other ways. 
you know, if, especially if you're in the gym, that's, that's a learning, you know, house for you. That's what it's for. Go in there, learn all the ways, learn all the things, you know, and then when you perform, whether that's in the gym or outside, you know, have a performance day where you're trying to do things the easiest way possible. Mm -hmm. But, but when you're learning and it's a learning day for you, a practice day for you, find the way that works for you, whatever that is, no matter how ridiculous it seems to the super experienced bro who's telling you how to do it, find your way, do it that way, then try it the bro's way. Try it, try it all the different ways you can think of and learn how to do all the things. Yeah. No, I think that's good advice. Um, one thing I would add is if you're here trying to, let's say you see someone just flailing and you're like, God, they're just using their arms too much. They don't have any weight on their feet. Instead of going up and saying, Hey, straighten your arms and twist instead, like, you know, have a conversation with them. Like instead of giving these hard and fast rules, say like, Oh, like, <clears throat> where do you feel that when you're climbing? And they'll be like, Oh, my biceps are blown up, blowing up. And it's like, yeah, good pump, bro, right? And But then you can be like, okay, so is there a way you can just relax your arms a little bit more? Like maybe use your legs more? And they'll be like, oh, I'll try that. And the thing is, a lot of times they'll naturally go towards straightening their arms. You didn't have to say straighten your arms to climb harder. Right. You just said, hey, like if you're tiring out because your arms are doing too much, can we use other parts of our body? And then they'll get to that same conclusion. They'll get to the same endpoint, which is maybe straighter arms on this boulder, but what they learned is something completely different. Yeah. They didn't learn a single rule to apply to everything. They learned, oh, like, I have this new framework I need to see things through. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, if you go into that situation with someone who's a beginner and you're essentially coaching them through something, assuming they want that advice, you know, assuming... Yeah. They're open to that. Don't fall into the trap of thinking they have to learn all the lessons today. You mm -hmm. know, if you're if you're talking to them, leading them into these answers and they aren't quite getting it yet, that's fine. You know, let them let them learn it another day. They're going to keep those lessons in their head. They're going to keep the things they that you said in their head and when they come in for the next session, they're going to think through those things again. So it's totally okay if you just say, cool, keep working on it, and yeah. you walk away. You know? Totally. Like, you know, we say this all the time in our workshops, like, this isn't uh, like a 30-minute sitcom. Like, everything doesn't have to be wrapped up perfectly by the end of the show. Right. Like, there are going to be plenty of boulders, like a lot of lessons that just don't get learned, maybe not in the first year. Mm -hmm. But I've had so many times where I'll be climbing, and suddenly it'll click. I'm like, oh, this is what, like, Brian was telling me four years ago right when he was saying pulling out on holds not down on holds mm -hmm. or something like that like it <clears> finally <throat> clicks i would like it was amazing advice back then i was just not ready for it yep and that's okay yeah it's really easy to want to give someone all the good advice you have but maybe they just aren't ready to receive parts of it you know and when they are they will yeah um one other thing on giving advice less is more Mm -hmm. Like if you're cueing someone and this comes from like, this is if it's climbing, strength, conditioning, whatever, um, the more cues you give someone, the worse they're going to do. Like yeah. for some people, it's just, if they're trying to do, if a beginner is trying to do a big move, you might just say, Hey, just try and get your body higher. Like that is going to do so much more than saying like, okay, flex your calf, toe in, pull out on the foothold. Right. Now you're going to want to <clears> squeeze <throat> your glute, lift your hip. Because suddenly they're not even going to be able to pull onto the wall anymore. Yeah. Because they're focusing on so many things. Yeah. Just simple. It's going to feel like chaos to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like talk through, like just have simple conversations um, and keep it, yeah, keep it simple. Yep. Agreed. Uh, you want to take a break? Come back with number three? Sounds good. All right. Break. 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 What's up, everybody? Chris here. I'll keep this short and sweet. I just wanted to let you guys know about our new updated proven plans that are now available on the website. These are the patterns that we've seen emerge after years and years of training hundreds of climbers. The patterns that at a specific level help those climbers 
reach the next level. And this includes our two newest proven plans, Just Climb More Boulders and Just Climb More Routes, written specifically for the new or novice climber. Why Just Climb More? Because frankly, we feel like the advice that most new climbers get, Just Climb More, is a lazy cop-out answer. While you will be climbing more, you won't just be climbing more. Instead, you'll be climbing more focused, more intentional, and you'll be learning a more efficient way to progress. We've updated those with weekly progressions, all of the most recent ideas and concepts that have been proven to work in training for climbing, as well as new videos for every exercise and every drill that you'll do. This is all laid out for you week to week, delivered in our mobile app. And you can choose to work with a coach. We've just hired a new coach to work specifically with everybody in these proven plans. And you can also join a group chat that's filled with other people also doing proven plans at the same time as you. Honestly, I don't think there's a better value in training for climbing. And you can check these out at powercompanyclimbing.com. Click on the train with us tab. All right, back to the show. All right, we have returned. Worst advice we got as beginners. I still get some of this advice today, actually. You know, if, really? I'm, in, if I'm in the gym and there's there's a bro there wanting to want to tell me how to do something, I still get the same ridiculous advice. And so I'm sure a lot of you out there are getting it, and hopefully some of you giving it are listening to and mm-hmm. learn that maybe maybe this isn't the best advice to just be doling out to people who may not even want it. Yeah. Uh, what's your number three or number one? I don't know which order we're going in here. Uh, we'll go number three. Um, so this is the whole relationship around top roping, lead climbing, and even I'm going to add in belaying mm. and how it was kind of discussed early on. So first it, I feel like lead climbing was put on this pedestal of, well, it's, it's very scary you know, it's very like all these different things to where, and I see this still, people will be like, well, you need a top rope 511 before you can even start lead climbing, you know, and there's so much thrown about it. And I think it does a couple things. One, like I definitely was taught that lead climbing is better than top rope. Like yeah. top rope was almost demonized. Yeah. And it's funny because I was talking with uh, Marina in the other day. And she was like, yeah, like, I'm just now learning that top roping is a good tactic. And I was like, yeah, me too. Right. A few years ago, I went to Smith and I climbed with a local there and he was just doing a bunch of fitness work. So he would go up things before me, um, hang draws if they were there or just climb. And no matter what it was, when he'd get to the anchors, he'd be like, hey, Nate, you want a top rope? Man, initially, I kind of bristled at this. Right. I was like, this is 13C. Like, I'm a grown ass man. I can, I can. (laughs) I can lead, (laughs) but it took me halfway through my trip to realize, oh no, this is just good tactics. Like you don't need to take giant 40 foot vert whips just because of ego. Like top roping is really, really smart. You learn a lot from it and it's a good tactic and skill. There's a reason, I mean, there's a reason, you know, high level climbers still use top roping. Um, So for me, it was this really weird dynamic of, well, only top rope long enough until you can lead, but leading scary. And then once you start leading, never top rope again. Cause that's, that's lame. Yeah. Um, oddly enough, not much emphasis ever put on belaying. Yeah, like, totally. I've, I've met a handful of sketchy <clears throat> climbers, like lead climbers where I'm like, God, I don't want to belay you. I met a handful in my, uh, you know, almost 20 years of climbing. I've met a shit ton of bad belayers. For sure. Tons. I see them every day. Anytime I go to the gym, anytime I go to the cliff, I look around, I'm like, oh man, like you're, I mean, y'all are going to be fine, but like, oh, you know, in other situations, this might not be great. Or it's just like, you know, you have to go up and talk to them and be like, hey, like, you know, if you're using an ATC, like, and they've already clipped bolts, stop spotting your climber. Yeah. Like, you know, things like this. But so much if emphasis is on, you need to be the good leader and not you need to be a damn good belayer. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms before, but you know, when you're belaying a leader, especially if either of you are beginners and maybe even 
<sighs> shit, maybe even more so if you're if you're really experienced climbers, because that's when we tend to make the most mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, that should be a closed relationship. Like it's not social time for whoever's walking up to the crag. It's not, let's get into a deep conversation with the belayer next to me. You know, that you and your climber are essentially a closed relationship at that point. So totally agree. Leave it that way. You know, you can socialize once that, that time is over and your climber's back on the ground. Yeah. Um, you're right. And I'll also throw in cleaning anchors into that situation. Like so many people make cleaning anchors this really scary thing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you're not ready for it yet. As if it's this, you know, this super complicated thing. And it really isn't. And that ends up scaring people into thinking it's this really scary thing. When in reality, it's very logical. If you understand why you're doing what you're doing, you can then approach any anchor set up in a smart way and clean it with logic instead of, oh, I didn't learn this anchor scenario, <clears throat> so I should be really scared now, Yeah, you know, and make it this make it this situation that's going to cause you a lot of stress and ruin your day. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, so yeah, I think that whole kind of relationship, you know, between top rope, lead, belay, it's something that I wish early on people had, would have explained it to me a little bit differently. Like, Hey, top roping, like that's a fine tool and it can be a cool place to start. Um, you can also, you can learn it, use it to learn things about rock climbs you want to get on, but it's going to be tough because you have to have someone set up the rope. So if you want to be, you know, independent, being able to lead is really helpful and being able to lead is something that's going to help progress your climbing too. And while there are, there are serious risks to it, you know, here are some things you can do to be smart. And if you want to be really smart, you take belaying very seriously. Yeah. Like, and that's. You know, that's not how I hear it taught so often. It's, I was listening just the other day. Um, someone was teaching people how to uh, lead, like kind of lead climb and all this. And they're literally their exact words were, well, if you do that, you're going to hit the ground and die. If you, like, if you backflip, <laughs> you're going to, like, this, so this is a backflip. You're going to hit mm. the ground and die if you do that. This is a Z clip. You're probably going to hit the ground and die if you do that. Like, you do this, you're going to fall and you're going to, like, just get cratered, probably be paralyzed. Yeah. And everything was gloom and doom. And I was like, like, I was climbing near them and I was getting anxiety. I'm on like a, I don't know, like a 510, like warming up. And I'm like, my heart's racing. Cause I'm like, am I about to die? <laughs> like, <laughs> am I doing something wrong right now? Yeah. And I was like, this is, this is the worst way to introduce someone to a sport. Like you should be <laughs> trying to make people comfortable. Say, Hey, here are good practices. Not try and terrify them away to the point to where they're going to be so scared. They're probably more likely to make a mistake at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, you know, you also said something that is kind of clicking in my head now about you shouldn't lead until you've top roped 511. There's this weird, weird, like, between a rock and a hard place where you want to learn to lead climb, but you're not good enough to lead climb. You know, I, th I think a lot of people get stuck in that zone, that mm -hmm. sort of limbo. And I think maybe I was really lucky in the gym that I started climbing in, which was Climb Time Blue Ash in Cincinnati. Because at the time, what's now the like, I don't remember what wall they call it. Maybe they call it the 60 or something. Maybe they still call it the lead wall, even though you can't lead it anymore. Hmm. But they're, the only lead wall we had in the gym started as like a panel of 45 <laughs> then a panel of 60 and then like four panels of 80 degrees almost horizontal sick you know that was our lead wall every we had a ton of vert top roping mm -hmm. and then the cave lead route you know yeah but they would put up massive jugs out the lead wall so as soon as you could climb 510 you could get up the first couple of panels and mm -hmm. that was enough like you clip the, the draw at the top of panel two and lower off you know it was a really fun way to learn to lead climb on giant jugs where you felt really safe you know mm -hmm. and you were only 
because of the steepness, you're only actually 10 feet above the ground or something, <laughs> you know? And everyone encouraged me to, to try it, to learn it. Here's how you clip, you know? When you're oh, at home, oh. set up all these quick draws in a row and clip with your right hand, clip with your left hand, flip mm -hmm. to the other side, clip with your right hand, clip with your left hand, you know? And you practice this constantly and then you're ready for the lead wall. And, but it was a really encouraging environment. And I think if you're in that situation where you have to be a certain level of good before you're allowed to lead climb, it's really easy to get trapped in the middle. And, and honestly, I don't think there is a, you have to be this amount of good before you can try lead climbing. Just maybe try to be cautious of putting yourself in situations where you feel danger and, you know, sit and think about those situations for a minute instead of pushing into this, I have to be brave, I have to do this, I have to, you know, climb to this next bolt even though I feel like maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know, and that kind of touches on one other thing with this whole scenario of like kind of lead and top rope is that um, there's, I feel like I see this certain level of almost bravado around lead climbing too. Like I'll talk with people who are like, no, I, I've never gotten scared ever. Lead climbing isn't scary. It's never once. And that's not what I'm trying to say. I, like, <laughs> I can't say that. I get scared all the time. Yeah. Like it's, that's why I'm a boulder now. <laughs> right um <laughs> like it it's an unnatural situation <clears throat> like you know you might climb over 100 <clears throat> feet in the air to take 40 foot falls and you're trying to try your physical hardest like at that like that is very difficult to do um so what i guess what i'm trying to say is there's a line between complete fear mongering with saying like you're gonna die anything you do lead climbing be terrified and there is no like oh, well, if you get good enough, lead climbing should never be scary at all. Like if you're never getting even a little bit of like butterflies or nervousness lead climbing, you're probably on things that are so easy that you're not pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, Alex Honnold gets scared lead climbing. For sure. Like every, I've maybe met one person ever and he's just kind of a freak. Like, you know, and, uh, you know, like if you never got scared lead climbing, I don't know if I'd want to belay you. Yeah, I've belayed a few people that, just constantly went with no fear mm -hmm. and it's a terrifying belay situation. Yeah. Like if I don't have a chance to keep you off the ground, I don't really want to be a part yeah, of it. Constantly climbing into dangerous situations. Yeah. But yeah, like <clears throat> a little bit of fear, like, and especially when you first start, cause it's unnatural. That's totally normal. Like these are things we work through, like, you know, so don't feel pressured if you're first starting to lead climb and you're like, oh, everyone around me says they never get scared. Like you can have fear. Like that's totally normal. We all have different levels that we work through. Uh, but if you're the one giving advice, don't add on to this. Don't say that fear shouldn't be there and don't, you know, make this this huge, scary, terrifying thing where it seems like death is at every corner. Yeah. And frankly, the most experienced climbers have strategies they've developed that help alleviate some of these fears, you know, mm -hmm. extended draws or pulling up a stick clip to clip through something while you're on lead. Or like you said, top roping is the norm in places where you can top rope the roots, you yeah. know, Smith Rock, the fins, places mm -hmm. like that. Uh, give me a top rope all day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I completely agree. Yeah. My top one is a really specific one, but I bet people hear it. Um, and I had one of the guys who managed the gym I was climbing in. I was kind of rocketing through the grades early. Mm -hmm. You know, I came in as a gymnast. I came in with the, the mindset of learning, and I was physically already very strong. So I was coming I was going through the grades pretty quickly and I made a comment that was naive on my part for sure to one of the gym managers oh, if I keep it up at this pace I'll get to this grade by this time mm -hmm. you know and he he straight up said no you'll plateau at this and you'll probably never get past it oh wow 
and it was like 13A or something. Little did he know that just stoked a whole new fire for you. It did. But I don't think it does for everyone else. You know, mm-hmm. I think everyone else, not everyone else, that's that's totally the wrong thing to say, but a lot of people will take that as, oh, this really experienced climber who manages this gym knows that this is where I'll get stuck. So mm-hmm. that's where I'm going to get stuck. Yeah. And I, I think that's a dangerous thing to say to anybody. You know, yes, there are going to be plateaus. Yes, there are places that you might have to work a little harder to get through um, or or double down on what you're learning instead of just how often you're hangboarding or whatever. There, there are strategies to get through almost every plateau you're going to experience. And saying otherwise is just bullshit, frankly. Yeah. So that one's specific, but, you know, luckily I had, there were guys in the gym, there was Josh Dees, there was Chris Eklund, these guys that I really looked up to, learned a lot from, who were all about, no, you're going to climb harder than we ever did. Oh, that's cool. You know? And that, that's this boost that a lot of people can use. And I also was good at using the boost of, well, you're never going to do that. Yeah, well, watch me, fucker. Yeah. You know? That's the attitude I take, but not everyone does, so. Yeah, no, and it's, you know, this is something that I've seen a bunch, like when we were on the road traveling a lot to do workshops. I remember we went to one gym and it was in a smaller city with not a ton of climbing near it. And we had done the workshop afterwards. We were kind of just chatting with a bunch of people. And this guy kind of pulls me aside. He's like, hey, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He was like, do you think I could ever climb 513? Mm. And I was just, I was waiting for him to like add the letter C or D or something after it. You know, he was climbing like V6, maybe V7, like solid. And I was like, shit, man, you could probably go out and do it in the next year. Like if you had the, op- like, yes, you can definitely do it. And he was like, really? Like, cause I only know two people that have ever climbed 513. And I was like, yeah, that, like, and, but this was such a real thing. Like, it's so easy for me to be like, I've met literally hundreds, if not thousands of people who've climbed 513. Right, right. Like, but for him, this was such a thing. Like to him only like, you know, maybe the head route setter and like one local strong dude had climbed 513. Mm-hmm. And so this was, even though no one had told him, hey, you can't reach this, he had felt that like kind of from being around. And I see, like, I still see this all the time when I climb. Like, so if you're someone giving advice and someone's like, oh, do you think I can ever do this? Like, you know, realistically, people can get to really high grades. Like, so don't put your own feelings on things. Um, like, there are plenty of people who I've heard be like, oh, well, like kind of the same thing. Like, well, you know, like V7 is really hard. Anything after that, like, you know, you're going to have to have really good genetics and well, <laughs> right, right. 30 hours a week of training, <clears throat> stuff like that. Um, so if someone tells you that, man, like. You got good hair, so your genetics are on point. Uh, my hair genetics are great. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I've met guys who climb 514 who most people would refer to as hobbyists. Yeah. Like, totally. Oh, like they, they just climb like two days a week <clears throat> and barely even train, but they get the job done. Yeah, I'll say it's also worth considering how you how you kind of bolster your own wow that was a hard word to say bolster your own accomplishments mm-hmm. because it can cause other people to mythologize it in a in a way that stops them from trying it. Mm. You know, I've certainly been guilty of this, like trying to be this hardcore badass track climber. When in reality, track climbing is really not that cool. It's not that <laughs> scary. It's no different than sport climbing, you know. By the time you're really good at it, you trust gear the same as you do bolts. It's just like sport climbing. It's no no more hardcore badass. And if it's a crack, you can just place them almost anywhere. Yeah, you can, you can, you can stay on top sew rope. that shit up, Yeah, which I did a lot. <laughs> and And I think we can go into saying like, oh, I just did this and it's so hard and you have to be so good and you got to be able to crimp credit cards. And, you know, and in reality, that's not true. It's how you might feel about it and you feel really cool and that's great. 
and I don't have the answer on how to do this in a more constructive way necessarily. So all I'll say is consider how you're doing it because it can really cause people to mythologize things or romanticize things in such a way that makes it scary or hard for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, I think that's a something that I've seen this with is people will talk about boulders or routes being they're like, oh, you know, it's really terrifying up there, huge runouts. And there were plenty of like climbs that I didn't try for a long time because I was like, oh, this is horrifying. Yeah. Or it's supposed to be. But then you go and try it and you're like, oh, maybe they just had a really bad belayer. Like mm -hmm. this, you, you should never get close to that ledge. Or, you know, I don't know why they were skipping this bolt. There's a jug here, you know, things like that. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's a good point. Um, so I've got a follow-up question for you here. Who do you think beginners should be wary of when it comes to advice? Mm, I'm going to piss some people off here. I'm sure of it. I've got two specific ex examples. <clears throat> um, this is someone I called the expert, S-P-U-R-T, on the blog once. Expert, okay. And I think you should be wary of the person who is always running around the gym giving everyone advice because those people are usually the ones who very often don't know what the hell they're talking about. Mm. Um, they find their value in just spraying beta and advice to everyone and and they've never really learned that much themselves because they don't value actually learning. They value trying to show everyone that they're smart. Mm. So that's the number one person I think beginners should be wary of. Okay. How about you? So I've got two different ones. And neither of these are technical. Like I wouldn't say that you can't take advice from these people. You just need to look at it with, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Versus teenagers, hmm. specifically teenage boys. Um, and I've seen this plenty of times where, you know, people will be like, oh, like Brandon jumped from V5 to V10 in three years. He's got to be doing something right. My first thought is, did Brandon just also jump from 14 to 17 years old? Right. Because the thing he probably did right was uh, he went through puberty. Mm -hmm. Like he has got, you know, so many hormones going through his body. If he's not jumping a grade a year, he's like... It, all you need to do is feed him, water him, and point him towards a climbing wall. He's going <laughs> right. to get stronger. Which isn't to say that they are giving bad advice necessarily, but they're going to be able to withstand freakish amounts of training, unlike what they'll ever be able to do afterwards in life. Right. So if you're like a 26-year-old who just started, don't look at the 17-year-old and try and emulate them. Right. They may have some really good advice. Like if they've been climbing since they were five, they might be like, oh, like... I like to climb only open hand once a week because it makes my fingers feel healthier. That can be some cool advice. Yeah. But if they say, I like to campus board five days a week, yeah. drink Mountain Dew, and I don't actually sleep. Uh, you know, yeah. be careful of that. Totally. It's also a good thing that teenagers don't actually listen to podcasts because otherwise we'd have the teenage mob coming after us now. Yeah. Um, so that's one. And once again, they can have good advice, but just be aware that what their bodies are going through, they're literally, they're practically not even humans. Yeah, and I think that, that goes for all ages, actually. We often see this bias of, I did this thing, so it must be what made me get better. Mm -hmm. And correlation isn't necessarily causation, because most of us are doing lots of things to try and improve. And it may not be that one really specific hangboard workout you did that helped you improve. It, mm -hmm. It's either a combination of things or it might be something totally different. You might have gotten better despite the thing that you think made you better. Yes. So you pretty much hit on what my second one is. Once again, these people I think have a lot to offer, but you need to be careful too. And that's people who've been climbing, let's say about two years and under. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a perfect fixed number. But typically in your first two years, you're going to keep getting better. And a lot of times it's about avoiding big mistakes rather than having huge wins. Yep. Um, and 
for some people, they might be like, I did a hundred pull-ups a day, five days a week. And that's what jumped me from V4 to V5. And it's like, well, you know, maybe climbing with someone else who was already climbing V5 was actually what did it. Yeah. Or maybe like, if you weren't so tired, you would have jumped from V4 to V6. Like in those early years, the learning curve is still so steep that it's really hard to put your finger on like, what was the one thing you were doing? Because if you're brand new, your endurance goes up every time you're climbing, your hand strength, like all these things keep improving month to month. Right. So it's really difficult to know like, oh, it was because I, you know, it's because I drank coffee before every single session. That's what it was and finished with a protein shake. And that's how I jumped from, you know, V4 to V6. Yep. Yep. Started with that big gulp. Extra caffeine every session. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're an N of one, it's it's damn near impossible to know what the the cause of your improvement was. Mm -hmm. And it's important to, I mean, these people were beginners recently, so they can give good advice. They can tell you, hey, like, it looks like your size in your shoes a little tight. Like, you know, (laughs) maybe go a half size up. Like, it looks like you're just in pain every time you climb. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, you know, I see you climbing here five days a week and you look like you're just tired a lot. Like, you can still get better at just three days a week and like, you can still have a lot of fun with that. Yep. Yep. I'll also say any any advice is worth considering. Mm-hmm. Totally. You know, and and if it's not totally offensive advice, give it a try. See what happens. You know, mm-hmm. there have been a lot of times where I got advice that I was like, I don't know, that's not gonna work. Mm-hmm. I'll try it. And then I try it and I'm like, oh, that's something new, you know, that that kind of worked. Yeah. Yeah. So give it a try. Yeah. And kind of branch off um, this, like the two years and under, I'd say this is kind of especially true for people who come from a different sport background. Mm-hmm. Like they can offer some really cool insights. You know, if you meet someone who, oh, you used to be a professional motorcycle racer, I'm all ears. Like I want to hear a lot of your insights because there's probably going to be some cool things there. But there might be some just crazy things where they're like, oh, like, I think this would apply. And I'll be like, yeah, cool, go for it. Like, I'm excited to hear how it goes. But for every, like, good thing that they bring in, there might be some things that just have no application. Yeah, totally. And we see, like, it's something that I see now and then with, like, uh, strength athletes. Like, you'll see it with power lifters or people who are used to very formulaic methods for improvement. Like, oh, if I do this plus this like that's going to make me better, like that can be hard to translate directly into climbing just because it's not formulaic like that. You know, it's not three movements. It's not a rep and set scheme, Yeah, things like that. Um, So once again, they can have some amazing inputs, like the knowledge on recovery, on how much you can stress yourself, on how to try hard, raise that arousal level before you give high efforts. These are all really cool things, but you know, like there are some things that are still questionable. And so when you take that advice, like think it through, maybe bounce it off other people. Yep. Yeah. And if you're the person giving advice, consider it before you just spew it out there. You know, some people are open to it. Some people aren't. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to determine that. And if you can't determine that, if you don't feel like you know, maybe just don't give it, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a tricky position to be in. And if any of you out there like feel a way about any of the things we're saying, like, Oh, I give that advice all the time and that's the best advice ever. Maybe consider it a little further. Yeah. No, I got one more follow up. What do you think was the best advice you got as a beginner? Um, wow. I got a lot of good advice, so it's hard to, I can start with mine if you want to think. Yeah, do it. Mine was do what gets you psyched. Mm. And that, I mean, still, like, it's something I didn't follow perfectly because I still, you know, there are a lot of phases in climbing. Like, people are like, oh, you have to choose either bouldering or sport. Can't do both. And in my mind, I was like, but I really like doing both. And for years, I did. And honestly, the worst, like, that was my best progression was when I would flip back and forth. And my biggest plateaus were always when I tried to only do one. And, you know, now it's like I've moved back to, oh, like I get psyched doing both. So I'm going to keep doing both. It's been good. Like 
You know, if I feel like just climbing outside, if that's what I'm psyched on, then that's what I do. If suddenly I'm like, man, I'm just a little burnt out on that. Like I'm just going to climb in the gym a little bit, maybe get outside now and then when I'm excited, that's what I do. And that for me, that's been really good in sustaining motivation through the years. Like it's the times when I stop doing what I personally am excited for and I try and force myself to do what I think I'm supposed to do. Those are the times when I start getting burnt out. Yeah. Um, maybe I get injured. Maybe I just, you know, yeah, basically I just stop giving a shit about climbing. Yeah, like, totally. So yeah, for me, that was some really good advice that I just need to continue taking is do what gets you psyched. Mm-hmm. I think I have mine and it was this, it's not traditional advice. It's the kind of advice I like, which is the okay. advice that fires me up. And it was a very dickish dude in the gym. <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to him. Dick. And he had set this vert top rope that was heinous. And he was like, he was the vert climber in the gym. Okay. Know? But he also put a lot of value on moving perfectly. He was one of those people who he climbed really well at that angle, but if he had to fight for it, he would just drop off. Like oh, there, one of there's those. no room for that. Yeah. And I sent his vert route before he did, but I battled. It was ugly. And when I came down, he was standing there watching and he was like, well, maybe someday you'll do it better. And then he turned around and walked away. Yeah. And I was like, maybe I will. So I did. And I just kept doing that route until I had it dialed hmm. and could do it really, really well. And I think maybe that helped me transfer the value of gymnastics where you learn something hard, you do it better and better and better and better and better until you've got it dialed and you can put it in a, in, into a routine that allowed me to take that skill and bring it into my climbing where, where what I had been taught was do a thing, move on. And I wanted to learn this better just so Kevin shout out if you're out there <laughs> could see that, yeah, I can do it better and I'm going to mm. do it better before you do it at all. Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, really set the tone for the next <laughs> 25 years. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I think advice is a really great thing and and it's important to be open to advice, to listen to advice, to get better at giving advice. And I think this is something we have to practice and spend time with and, you know, recognize that we can also do it in a poor way. Yeah. So just be conscious of that. Be careful of that. The beginners out there need need some encouragement and need people on their side. And just yesterday, we were talking to Sydney Smith, who's the general manager at Momentum in Houston. Yes, Silver Street. Silver Street specifically. And she, we were talking about beginners and this idea of gatekeeping using climbing grades. It's something I don't see all that often because I'm in my own home gym. I don't spend a ton of time in big commercial gyms and you know, or frankly, outside around big groups of people. It's a pretty small community here in Lander. And, yeah. and I don't see the gatekeeping. So I was asking her about, you know, how do you see it often and, and how do you alleviate it? And she had a really great piece of advice that she gives to her employees that I think we could all learn from and maybe put into action ourselves if we're in commercial gyms. Um, and that's that if you see somebody with rental shoes on, that can be, uh, you know, this obvious sign that they're a beginner. And some people might see that as a reason to, you know, put them down or, or look at them differently, you know, but, but in reality, those might be the future super psyched climbers and, you know, even if not, it doesn't matter. They still deserve the respect of, hey, we've got this cool community. Hello, welcome. You yeah. know, it can be as simple as saying hi. It can be, you know, hey, do you want some advice about that? You know, it doesn't mean you have to spray them down the whole session, but 
those little bits of encouragement or asking them, do you want this advice? That can go a really long way to convincing them that climbing is this more inclusive thing and not not giving them the impression that it's a this boys club or something. Yeah. No, I I think it's such a good way to go. And it's uh so I climbed down in Silver Street, um in Houston. And man, that's one of my favorite things to do is I go shoot the shit with like newer climbers because they're so excited too. Yeah. You know, you walk like and you get to meet so many cool people from different backgrounds. Uh, and I mean, for a lot of them, like, I think it's just helpful to hear that what their experience is experiencing is normal. They'll be like, my hands hurt. And, or they'll be like, man, this is my third time. Like in the last few times I couldn't even grip my steering wheel going home. Am I doing something wrong? I'm like, no, you're doing it right. Right. Like that's, you know, you just keep doing this. It's going to get better, you know? And yeah, it's just like fun to talk with these people mm-hmm. like, and it. And especially like there are so many situations, something that kind of bothers me is people, there are people who are like, oh, there's this mentor gap now. Like no one's out there mentoring people, new climbers. But these are also the people that when they see a beginner, they turn, they're like, well, it's a shit show here. I'm going to go to another wall. Right. True. Like, man, if you see people like going and rapid firing on a boulder in front of others, like I'll go up, chat with them be like, hey, like you're going to do better if you rest longer. So like find like notice the order that they're going in, pick one person and go after them every time so that, you know, you'll be in the lineup. So you'll know when you're going to go and that's going to help you rest a little longer. Yeah. Things like that, like takes two seconds. And then that might be the first time that they realize there's a lineup. Right. You know, they're so, they're so tunnel visioned on the purple boulder. They don't even realize there's other people there right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like we were all, we were all beginners once we were all like super psyched beginners once, like, you know, yeah, embrace it. Like, help build your community. Like, yeah, and you know, there is a, there might be a, this bad ratio of mentors to climbers, but there are a lot more climbers. So maybe mentorship just looks different. And now you're just part of a larger mentor group, you know. And a climber might have thirty different mentors on their way to climbing outside for the first time. Yeah, you know? so. Be a constructive part of that. And, you know, that's our challenge to you is pick somebody with rental shoes on in the gym and just say hello, you know, be nice, be welcoming, ask them if they want advice, if they're struggling on something, whatever it is, that's the challenge. Yeah. You know, you know and I think you nailed it with the first part, especially just be nice, be welcoming. Like yeah. if someone comes in and they feel welcomed and they're having fun and people are nice around them, they're going to want to come back. Like that alone is going to make help make them a better climber. It's going to me- make them love climbing more. Yep. Like that's such a easy <clears throat> gift that you can help give to someone. Yep. And another gift is just to tell them, hey, Power Company has these proven plans called Just Climb More. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe gift it to them for Christmas. It's coming up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think this one's going to go out maybe even today, which is a rarity in this podcasting Ooh, okay. world because I create a backlog and <laughs> value having a giant backlog. But yeah, so be on the lookout for that stuff. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, if you've gone to someone with rental shoes on, let us know. Let us know how it went, either in our Facebook community, on our Instagram, somewhere. Shoot me a message. I'd love to hear about how it went and if you have a great strategy we can share it on the podcast sometime you know i i think it's important that we all engage in in this kind of welcoming activity and anti gatekeeping and just trying to trying to be the open inclusive community that we think we are Mm -hmm. and making sure that we are Um, and uh Like I said, check out the Just Climb More Proven Plans. If you're a beginner climber looking to improve faster, they're on our website, powercompanyclimbing.com. You can hit me up on the Instagram, at Power Company Climbing, or on the Facebooks. Also look for our Facebook community group there. It's a a big community that gives great advice and, you know, is a place you should feel open to asking for advice if Mm -hmm. you're a beginner climber. So check that out 
Uh, you can also ask us questions on Twitter. It will appear that we are gatekeeping and not answering your questions because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. Time